coming off on today's episode of the Salesman Podcast. Uh, and they found a similar area inside human brains, and they've discovered that this mirroring is responsible for imitation, learning, and empathy. That's why when someone cuts their hand, finger on a, a piece of paper, even by just saying that to people, just the picture of it, people cringe. That's your mirror neurons responding to that. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Sales and Podcast, and welcome to today's episode. On today's show, we have an interesting one, and it is with, let me pitch him first as the guest. It's Mark Goulson. He is an ex-FBI and policed hostage negotiation trainer. He's got clinical experience. He's got academic experience. He's a real knowledge on everything to do with changing people's minds, and that's exactly what we're talking about on today's show, how to move someone from a no to a yes, and I guess it works the other way around as well. Clearly, this is applicable in sales. It's also applicable in the corporate world, perhaps, where you're trying to get your ideas and opinions across, and it's just a good skill set to have. You can learn more about Mark over at markgulson.com. The books, his books, everything else that we talk about is available in the show notes over at salesman.red forward slash 179. And with all that said, let's jump into today's show. Hi, Mark, and welcome back to the Salesman Podcast. Well, Will, I'm glad to be back. Good man. I, I wanted to have you back on from a whole bunch of feedback from the audience, from my experience of our episode as well. And I feel like there's loads more to go out here. And I want to talk today about moving people from one decision to another, from no to yes in the world of sales is going to be the situation most of the time. But before we get into all of that, I feel, I guess I've got to address two two questions, a dual part question to, before we get into the topic. One is this physically possible to move someone who is in a, 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 a who believes that no is the correct answer to whatever question you've asked them to a yes? And then second part of that, even doing any of this, is this an ethical thing to do? I think it's ethical. Well, the first thing is yes, it's possible unless you're you're meeting with someone who, in their mind, had had no uh, just stuck. So. Uh, so when people call you and they leave messages and these telemarketers, uh, I, I find that really annoying. They call me on my cell phone. I can't escape from them. And so I, I think just uh, uh, just just to get out of that, I, I often say, can't speak to you now. Sometimes I'm even more gruff. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll say, no, no, thank you. Uh, or I'll say, uh, please don't call me again. And so, uh, so if it's uninvited, then it's difficult. But even there, you might be able to get through. I was, I was, I was I'll give you one little technique that a, a call center, uh, or a, a center that calls out, they tried this and they said, it's kind of interesting that it kind of works. And so what happens is the message is you call and if someone picks up or even if you get a message, what you what you say is hello. This is ah oh, darn ah oh, I forgot oh I, I'm sorry I, I'm just uh, I'm just gonna have to call you back, and then you hang up, and so and so the idea is you've left them hanging, not even knowing what you're about. Uh, they didn't have to say no because you hung up on yourself, but that has a way of sometimes disarming people so that when you call back and you say. Hi, I'm the I'm the person who hung up because I, you know, I'm the I hope I didn't swear, but I, I'm the one who hung up because I, you know, I was just, I had to get to something, and I really apologize for that. So it's so that they said, you know, it's really interesting how being able to just change the pattern, change the pattern of the interaction. They said we've been getting some good results from that. So I don't want to hang on to this uh, too long, Mark. I want to get into the crux of the conversation. I want to get into how we go about doing all of this because it's absolutely fascinating. But is that just not outright manipulation when you are bare face lying to someone on the other end of the phone about a situation like that? And uh, is that ethical? Is that okay? Is that not okay? And I get it, obviously it depends on the situation. I appreciate all that. But what are your initial thoughts on that? Well, we might have to edit it out because I don't like to teach people to be more manipulative. Mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, I when I wrote my book on listening, Just Listen, I actually turned down a number of clients because they said, oh, we want to teach our sales force how to be better listeners. And what I realized is they didn't want to teach them to be better listeners at all. They just wanted to use some of the tools in Just Listen, which were kind of different than what they were used to. And it was all about being better manipulators and closing more sales. So I almost want to delete what we just said, except it's kind of comical. And, and actually what happened is I was telling a friend of mine, and I'd like him to succeed. So it really wasn't a training. He said, what, what can some of our uh, salespeople do? And, and the I, re, in reality, I wanted him to succeed because he's a friend. He's not a bad guy. But um, I'm, I... I almost regret telling you what I already told you. But <laughs> no, no, no. It, it was a good example, and I appreciate that because, and I, I, I obviously led, led you down a little bit of a track there, and so I appreciate you giving an anecdote which makes sense and 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 goes into the situation. I don't think we need to hang on to this uh, and dwell on this conversation of eth uh, whether something's ethical or not because uh, the audience are smart enough to know what is and what isn't. I just wanted to get your thoughts, but you brought up uh, a good point with that as well. Yeah, but you're going to get some calls from people saying, see if Dr. Goulson has any more of those <laughs> nifty kind of manipulations. That was really neat. I tried it and worked. So uh, I want you to remind me if I, if I get called back for another show to say, uh, Mark, I want to remind you that you kind of slipped and got a little, uh, not illegal, but you were manipulative in our last show. And I'll say, oh, well, thanks for reminding me. I'll tell you what, Mark, a show with the title of How to Manipulate Anyone would get probably the most downloads out of any other show we've ever done. I would download it personally because I think most people know right and wrong, but it's super interesting to walk that line perhaps with things that don't really matter. I think on the last show I used an example of getting my girlfriend to do the dishes and things of that nature where you know, manipulation perhaps isn't going to hurt anyone and is just it's fun to, because I love the psychology of all this and I love experimenting with it. But, you know, in the B2B world, perhaps it's not the best place for it. But you, uh, with no, your we'll initial, see. go on. If, you get a, if you're going to get a lot of listeners, maybe you can con maybe you can manipulate me into doing that show, Will. We'll see, we'll see. Let's well, go, go with this one. There's number three, Mark. Next episode you come on, we're going to do that. To keep everyone in suspense, all the audience. So you brought up something interesting and that was when the telemarketer called you and most of my audience, if not all of them, aren't telemarketers. We're all B2B sales professionals. So we're one separation from this, but it's a good example. When they called you immediately, you said no without knowing what they were about, what knowing what huge, incredible value they could be offering you that could change your life. You, you had this no in your mind from the beginning. And this is the kind of thing that I want to talk about on today's show. Is there a way to know uh, for just from that initial bit of conversation that or any questions that we should be asking or the tone of voice or anything like this is there any way to know how embedded the person's mindset is on that initial no because of course uh, this what we're going to talk about is probably useful in a, a variety of circumstances but if someone's staunch no you're probably better picking your battles and not trying to convince them otherwise so is there a way to know um how ingrained someone's thought pattern is on this from you know is there any way to get that from them quickly there's a there's a process in which if you can articulate the negative that someone's thinking before they even think it or say it often they will lean into it because what you're doing is you're mirroring them uh and they lean into it so if i uh, uh, i think one of the ways you could do that if let's say you are a telemarketer, is uh, there's a good chance that the person picking up the phone, when they sent you a telemarketer, uh, is you're going to die for the sins of the other telemarketers that have called and annoyed this person before. Um, and I think if someone said to me, uh, and I, and I give them a half a sentence maybe depending on what kind of mood I'm in, if they said uh, if they picked up the phone and said uh, uh, hi, uh, this is a telemarketing call, and I and uh, and uh, 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 and like you, I hate telemarketing calls. And if they said that to me, I'd go, "What?" If they just up front, you know, it was just obvious, this is a telemarketing call, and like you, I hate telemarketing calls. At the very least, I'd be kind of curious, and I, and I'd say, "What?" And they might say, "Yeah, when people call me, I can't stand it." 
uh, when people interrupt and get my cell phone, I can't stand it. So I'm thinking, so why are you doing it to me? But I'm a little bit intrigued. And uh, I might not hang up right then and there because they got where I'm coming from. And, and then if they said, the reason I am calling you is because I've discovered a company uh, that I, th I think the value it gives to people like you is so tremendous, and this is the way they reach them. So I thought I'd give it a shot, and, and I hope you'll give me another 30 seconds of your time to see if, uh, uh, if you think so too. So you so there's a number of things that's going on there, it seems. Are you uh, trying to break down the no in little chunks? In that example, you're giving yourself another 30 seconds rather than trying to convince them uh, otherwise in one outright beautiful Shakespearean like, sales pitch. Uh, are you trying to just break things down slowly? Is that the best way to go about it? I, I think you're breaking down things slowly, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to track, again, with what they're thinking that's negative that they haven't expressed yet. I remember years ago I presented to a, uh, a big financial services company and I knew that when they saw that I was a psychiatrist, even if I was a hostage negotiation trainer, there'd still be a, a bunch of them who would say, what does he know about our business? So one of the ways that I got their attention right out of the gate is, uh, is I said, um, I'm, uh, I regret that they put MD at the end of my name, which isn't managing director. It means medical doctor. I regret even more that they said psychiatrist because some of you have a wife or kids who are going to a psychiatrist and it hasn't helped them at all. And furthermore, uh, within about a minute, you'll probably sense that I know very little about your business. So what they're thinking is, boy, he just put into words exactly everything I'm thinking that's negative. And then what I said is, but in my career, I've had to talk some people out of killing themselves. I'd have to talk, I've had to talk some people into turning over a gun in a hostage situation. I've had to talk some people into talking to their drug-using 23-year-old. I've had to talk some couples into having sex again when they've slept in, this, in different bedrooms for five years. So I know a little bit about persuasion. And so I could see in the audience that as I was going through that, that immediately I engaged all of them. He must know something. If he's able to do that, he must know something. And what's going on on a deeper psychological level here, Mark, when you are pulling out what they are going to say before they say it? What's going on within their subconscious, perhaps? Or what's like the underlying patterns that are happening? Well, in my book, Just Listen, uh, I'm, I'm a fan of neuroscience. And there's actually a concept that I... Uh, that I named. I'm the first person to name it, and it's called the mirror neuron gap. And what that means is that uh, many years ago, in the late 1980s, researchers found an area inside macaque monkeys that, uh, that was related to monkeys imitating other monkeys' behavior, and it was called monkey see, monkey do neurons. And uh, and they found a similar area inside human brains, and they've discovered that this mirroring uh, is responsible for imitation, learning, and empathy. That's why when someone cuts their, cuts their hand, finger on a, a piece of paper, even by just saying that to people, just the picture of it, people cringe. That's your mirror neurons responding to that. What they've also discovered is that when mirror neurons are deficient, in other words, when people can't mirror other people's, that seems to be related to autism. So autistic individuals are not able to pick up on social cues. But the concept that I picked up in doing this for 40 years is something called a mirror neuron gap. And what that means is if you feel that you are caring more about the world, if you're conforming more to the world and other people's psychological and emotional needs than they are to you, it creates a gap and a hunger for people to kind of conform to your emotional and psychological needs. One of my uh, good friends and 
possibly the top executive coach in the world, is a fellow named Marshall Goldsmith. And one of his best books was called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. I recommend it to everyone. It's a great read. It was a top book of the year several years ago when it came up. And what he basically said is what gets you to a certain level of success technically won't make you as uh, uh, won't get you to your full potential unless you have a way to work with people. And if you turn off people and you offend people, they're less likely to want to make you successful. And he named uh, 20 egregious uh, behaviors that widen the mirror neuron gap. So some examples of those is when someone is saying yes but to you, when someone interrupts you, when someone uh, has to have the last word, when someone is telling you how smart they are, all those things which offend us, they offend us because what's happening is they are, instead of mirroring us uh, and we're leaning into that, they're actually pushing us away. Now, what I've discovered is if you can do the opposite, if you actually mirror what someone's thinking or feeling and you close the mirror neuron gap, people lean into that and you develop momentum you hook them and you develop momentum towards you. When I give presentations on that, I often show some of the top tearjerker movies of, uh, of the last 20 years. Uh, and uh, one of my favorites, and I'll just say it, but <laughs> this is just for your older audiences, but some of them may have seen it. There was an iconic movie called Field of Dreams. And it was a story about Kevin Costner building a baseball field in Iowa. And nobody in the movie knew why he was doing it, including him. And at the end, he realizes that he was building it so he could fulfill the dream of his dad, who had died many years before. And there's a scene at the end where he discovers it's his dad, uh, who's this baseball player who never got to play baseball. And at the end, he looks at his dad as a young man and says, want to have a catch, dad? And every man in that audience watching it starts to cry because it narrows the mirror neuron gap. Anyone who has an ache for closer connection to their dad cries at that movie. The, ones that I, the one that I use now is Silver Lining Playbook because at the end of that, you have these two quirky people played by Bradley Cooper and uh, uh, Jennifer Lawrence, and they're quirky. And at the end of the movie, after missing each other, at the end, uh, there's a scene in which they finally connect. Uh, and when they connect, you start to cry. And why do we cry? Because if you're feeling kind of disconnected in the world, if you feel alone, when someone is kind to you, when someone cares about you, and, and they don't want anything from you, when someone even says to you, are you okay? We often tear up when people do that. And, that's because, and we tear up because we feel relief. Because at that moment, all the aloneness that we're feeling or all the upset we're feeling suddenly has gone away because someone has mirrored us. And so getting back, I'm sorry for that long-winded explanation, but, uh, uh, but getting back to what we were talking about before, about how I talked about what was negatively going on in people's minds towards me, I was accurately mirroring them. Because in their minds, there was a skepticism, there was a cynicism, there was a belief that this was going to be a big waste of their time. And when I actually articulated that, not only did I narrow the gap, but that showed a certain boldness, maybe even a brazenness. And so they were drawn to that, like, how can he start out a talk uh, uh, putting into words all the negative things that we feel towards him? Let me try and put this into context just for a second, Mark. Uh, from you're a B two B salesperson, you've gone you know through the steps of the sales process. You get to the end, you feel the prospect is perhaps a little cold in this you know sales meeting where you're hoping you're going to close the deal. So you, you know there's a number of negative objections which they're going to have. So you bring them up before they voice them. You're building, and I guess the. The summary of all that, and I love the science behind all this. I could I could dive into that deeper all day, honestly. Um, but to keep it a, a bit more big picture, you by doing this, by narrowing this gap, you're building super deep rapport with them. You've been bold, perhaps, uh, so they want to be led by you slightly more. What happens then if they still say, if they're still in their logical brain, 
even though they've got all these emotions going on, they're, they're, ba- they're now vying for you as the salesperson. They they want you to win the deal, even though you know perhaps it's you know they've not quite got it yet or whatever the problem is, whatever the objection is. What do you do if they're still in their logical brain and they still are no, but you know it's the right thing for them, so there's no ethical questions. You just need to tip them over the edge. What do you do? Is there a, is there a process or a structure after this point once you've done all this groundwork beforehand? Okay, so this is going to be a ninja move that you're <laughs> going to love. This is this is a this is a master move. It's not for everyone, but if you know they have a problem, and they know they have a problem, and you know that you have the answer or solution to their problem, and you have a sense that they know that logically, but they're still pushing back. Here is the ninja move. Now you can't use this with all your customers and clients. But it will work in many of your customers and clients who are male and over the age of 45. Uh, And what you say to them is, uh, can I ask you a slightly different question? And hopefully they'll say, what? You know, the law. And you'll say to them, you've been disappointed before, haven't you? And they're going to say, what? Yeah, I'm guessing that you've agreed to certain deals, you've said yes to certain solutions and products, and not only didn't they work out, you felt embarrassed and you regretted saying yes to them, and we've all done that. And is it possible that uh, you don't have enough confidence that this will work out to overcome your feeling that you can't go and say yes to something that could backfire? Is it possible, the American vernacular I might use is, is it possible that you've been burned before and after you got through that, you said, I can't go through this again. And is it possible that you don't have enough confidence that this is the right fit for you? And what's coming up is the desire to not make another mistake. And I bring that up about males who are 45 and older because men who are 45 and older Uh, There's more of a fear of making another mistake than of actually getting something right. And that's because when you're male and you're 45, there is a cumulative effect of all the bad decisions you've made. You don't share it with anyone else because you feel ashamed and embarrassed. But inside, you've had multiple times when you when as smart as you thought you were was was as foolish as you turned out to be. And it was traumatic to your self-confidence. And so that's why when you're speaking to someone who's over 45, they're very hesitant about repeating that negative experience. When people are younger, they haven't yet messed up enough for it to haunt them. Does that make any sense to you? This makes total sense. Uh, oh, I think it does. Tell me if I'm right or wrong here, Mark. So you you would perhaps go through the objections of the product, the features, the benefits. If that isn't working, you perhaps then go that level deeper and then, you know, what you're describing there, I think you'd need to be very skilled in the way you were handling it. I think if a 29-year-old like myself started talking like this to you, and you weren't you, you were some executive, you'd probably be thinking, who's this young dickhead who thinks he knows everything? And so I think, you know, there's there's a very fine line to tread there. But is the skill in all of this then going to the deeper and deeper levels of objections and the more emotional ties that come uh, to, to all of it underneath. Yeah, be, and, and here's how you could get away with it as a, twi- a, a how old are you? 29? 29. Okay, so here's how you could get away with it with a, even a 45-year-old guy who may be looking at you. You don't know anything about anything, but you could, if you see that it's not working, that you're overcoming their objections isn't working, uh, what you can say is... Um, can I ask you a different question and share an observation? And maybe you can tell me if it's true. Now, I'm 29, so it's not true for me yet. But what I have observed and what I have heard from people who are in their 40s is that there's this build-up effect of some of the bad decisions they've made in life, both in their businesses, personally, they're divorced. And as those build up, especially for men, they begin to question their competence, Now, I'm sure as I go through life, that's going to be me. So it's not happening to me just yet. But does that make any sense to you as a man in his 40s? Would you agree with that observation? So there's a way to speak respectfully. Mm -hmm. uh, And 
And again, I think the more that you can accurately put into words what's going on in, uh, inside someone in a respectful way like that, that's going to win so much respect. In fact, I think if you did that, I can't say it'll do it all the time. If I was that person, I'm over 45, and you said that to me, and then it, I would take a double take and I'd say, Will, that, that's exactly what's going on. <laughs> how, how did you know that, Will? That's exactly why I'm hesitant. You know something, Will? I wasn't even aware of that. Well, it's just something I've noticed. I mean, you know, I've asked you because I've seen a number of people in their 40s, and when they push back and they say no to something that would work for them, I know there's something else going on besides this not being the right solution when it is. And so I've just been trying to observe what might be going on. And, you know, apparently what I just told you is true. So uh, I'm going to have more confidence now when I speak to people who are over the age of 40 that this might be going on. And thank you for confirming it. Uh, they're going to connect to you in ways that they wouldn't connect to anyone else your age. And a cliched question, and I want to dive into that a little bit further as well. But, uh, and I, I know the answer where we're going to lead to with this one, but how important in the world of B2B sales, B2B, any sales or business endeavor, how important is, you know, the product? Of course, it's got to be good, yada, yada, all that stuff. We all know and appreciate. But how much leverage do you have when you've built that really deep connection? Is, is that the crux of this whole thing? And is, is a connection worth more than anything else in business? Well, no, I think the connection is incredibly powerful. The point is, if you develop a connection that's built on trust and you're understanding the other person, if you then take advantage of them, they're going to hate you more than if you didn't have that contact. Here's an anecdote that I think uh, some of your listeners and you might like. When I was, I, I've retired as a practicing psychiatrist, but you know, about 10 years ago, these, uh, these drug representatives would come in from the various pharmaceutical companies, and they must hire for looks, because all the <laughs> women that came in, they're just, I mean, they're, they're all beautiful, and they're all upbeat, and they're perky, and a lot of, you know, doctors like me, you know, we're drooping, we're burned out, you know, and uh, we have... Uh, patients that we don't know what's going on and here you have this look of sunshine coming in doesn't mean that you'll buy from them so I remember I started coaching them on how to sell me and I said to them I said try this with some of try try this on your next two or three calls when you're calling on doctors and so you'll get there they'll probably let you in because they made an appointment and they couldn't get out of it. And you had in those days, they'd give you all these kind of neat samples. You get flashlights, you get pens, you get free samples. They can't do that anymore. And so when I coached uh, these young uh, women, young, they're in the late twenties, I'd say, if you did this, here's how you would sell me. If your product is as good as the competitive products, so it has to be up to speed uh, because we're talking about my patients. But if they're all similar and, you know, I'd be open to try something that has similar efficacy and safety. If you said this to me, if you said, Dr. Goulston, can I ask you a different question? At first, I'd be annoyed because I, I think that you're asking me for some free advice. But I probably wouldn't throw you up. I'd say, yeah, okay. Uh, and if you said to me, is it still fun? I would say, What? And if you said to me, is it still fun being a doctor? Because I know it's much more difficult. There's more regulations. There's more insurance problems. You have problems with your front office. You have problems collecting. Uh, there's a lot more headaches. And you guys work so hard. I just want to know if it's still fun for you. And I told, uh, I, I told these young women, I said, if you said that, I would pause I would feel cared about by someone, and I may be someone who doesn't feel cared about by anyone, including people at home. And, I, I, and what I would say is, I'd pause, and I'd say, you know, every day I help a few people. Some people I don't, but every day I help a few people, and I think I make a difference. And yeah, it's still fun. Yeah, are there a lot of headaches? Yes. But it's still fun. 
but I would be grateful to that person because they would help me focus if I was feeling particularly burned out that day or resentful, they would help me refocus on the fact that I still like being a doctor. Can you see, but can you see how that closes the mirror neuron gap? Mm -hmm. If I'm feeling that I'm taking care of the world and uh, the woes of the world and I've got all these frustrations and no one gives a hoot about me, for someone to say something like that, uh, they would be memorable. This is amazing. And I've got one question to wrap up this part of the show, Mark. And that is, so we're very focused in the show so far on the words, the language, how deep we're going with the person in front of us to to build that rapport and build that deeper connection. And I want to know how much of this is words and language, how much of it is the intangible of sat the being sat opposite them, having your phone turned off, you know, being really intent and purposeful with your time with them, you know, deep eye contact, all these kind of things. And then how much of it is to down to you know, your tonality, the pace of your voice, because as you tell them stories, you're using a very deliberate pace and the anecdotes that you, the, the, the way you were using your, your voice with the anecdotes is different to how you were using the questions, examples that you'd uh, used prior to them. So I'm intrigued of how much of it is the words that we're saying, how much of it is how we're saying it, and how much of it is, if you forget all that, just being there for someone and giving them some time. Well, I think you have to ask, you have to drill down what your intention is. Now, when you're early in the process. So when I was training as a medical student and then a doctor, what was more, what was of more concern for me was making sure that I dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's, that I asked all the questions because otherwise I'd have to keep going back to the patient and asking them. And so I wasn't particularly present to them as a person. It was making sure that I got the diagnosis right. But then after time and experience, when I internalized that and I could, without those questions, within 45 seconds, I could tell whether someone had depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, a personality disorder, because I'd just been doing it for that 10,000 hours that makes you an expert. And then you have to decide what your intentions are. And the intention, I think, once you get over the particular product technology, I think the best salespeople, especially now, because people don't like to be hard sold, is you actually have to care about the uh, the customer. I, I remember in Just Listen, I wrote a, an anecdote where I went to some lunch meeting and there was a young middle, late 30-something guy. I think he was in the insurance business and there was a young woman in some other business and we were at lunch together, and he asked her these amazing questions, not amazing, he'd say, where'd you go to college? What was your major? What'd you like best about college? Uh, and he came up with some questions that I'd never heard of that I actually jotted down. They were great. I took him aside afterwards, and I said, uh, this is some unsolicited advice. Um, you don't talk to billionaires. I do. And if you spoke to someone who was a billionaire had tons of money, and they heard you, they'd be able to probably tell you the training course you took. So here's the advice. Uh, if you're going to ask questions like the ones you asked, care about the answer. But what it came across is those were good questions, but you didn't care about the answer. It just felt like you were doing it because you were trained to do it, and then you, were, then you wanted to do a bait and switch. And that's okay with younger people and uh, and the young woman. You know, she didn't even notice that. But as you're trying to sell, but when you more say that, and let me just interrupt here for a second. Do you really think she didn't notice it, or was she being? And this is a very minute and narrow example, of course. But do you think that she would have felt that on a on a subconscious, deeper level that he was leading her down a path? Because I've felt that before, and I feel that the Obviously, questions are the the basis of the consultative salesperson, and I, I, I've, this could be a topic in its own and a whole podcast in its own, Mark, because I think a lot of salespeople ask these questions that they've been told this is a good question to ask. I don't think they're present. I don't think they really care about the prospect, and I think it comes across like you're just ticking a, a checklist, and so you're not achieving anything from that. Um, so, you know, I interrupted you then, but do you really feel like 
she did just brush it off and is it okay on perhaps younger people to to talk like this or should we always be going for that deeper caring question well i think i think you can get away with it with younger people because when you're in a business setting especially uh, when i see millennials in um uh, in uh in the in uh, america they're all talking fast they're all talking transactionally there's almost it's almost, and I and I understand that. It's like, let's get it done. Let's move this forward. Let's get it done. Let's sell. Let's do whatever. But there's an agitation. I'm exhausted when I'm around them. Uh, it would be it would be different though if that millennial was out on a date. You know, so in that setting, we're 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 young. We're we're new at our business. This is kind of what we're talking about. We don't yet have the experience, and so we're taught various skills and techniques and I'm not against them I mean I uh, uh, there's a book I'm about to write which you'll have me on probably in a year and it's it's how to be a hundred percent present in a distracted world and I'm co-writing it with this amazingly dynamic woman who is attractive she's likable I think we'll get a hair on rather than you Mark if that's all right you know, I'll have. Am I joking? Am I joking? She's <laughs> never on the show. I'll, 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 rec I'll recommend her to you. She'd be on the show, uh, and she's terrific. But one of the things she realizes at age forty, with a fifteen-year-old daughter, she says, "I'm not present. I'm intense, but I'm not present anywhere." And it's to her credit that she knows this. She's missing out on something by just being intense all the time, and she gets away with it because she's so likable. Uh, I, uh, but she's looking for a transition, and I said, everybody likes you, but you are intense, but you could be the poster child for learning how to be present. You know, you could sell your business to people who are in the intense level thing, but you, uh, I said, you do a much better job. I'm too old for this. Uh, I don't show as well as you would in front of an audience, but you could talk about how you learn to be present and you were oh, and, and you were never present. So uh, and and so I've discovered the process to follow. That if you follow these pro this process, the other person will experience you as a hundred percent present with them. And and by by that I mean emotionally and psychologically present. I don't mean present like Donald Trump in which he overwhelms you. So that's not presence. That's overwhelming intensity. He well, talks over. That's some tease, Mark, for the next episode uh, where we have you on. We'll dive into that for sure, especially if there's a process in place because I feel, and I don't know if this is an age thing, you'll have a better um, uh, group of memories and, and resources to, to come back through, but I'm not sure if this is a, an age thing, whether it's the fact that technology is ubiquitous and you're constantly being bombarded by every social network, by every email, by every text message, by every phone call, and I only have to look at our house when I go home now of my dad, who is not on Facebook, is a staunch anti-mobile uh, consumption. Um, he's, he's very adamant, or he was very adamant, that he, he was not going to have a smartphone. He doesn't need one uh, and all this. And then I go home and he's watching the Liverpool football match whilst Googling the players and the everything else is going on in the background. So for him to change over be less present with the team he's been supporting for you know since he was a young kid and to be not really watching the game i feel like there's there's more to this story than perhaps just age and um, again we can talk about this on another show and with that mark i've got one question I asked you this last time you came on the show and i'm going to ask you it again what if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self what would be the one thing you tell him to help him become better at sales I have a late mentor named Warren Bennis, and he passed away a couple years ago. Uh, and he was one of the world's authority on leadership. And one of the things that he uh, said was, be a first class noticer. Because when you notice, it's different than looking, watching, and seeing. When you look, watch, and see, you're an observer. But when you notice, you're, you're connected to whatever you're noticing. So even now, since we're doing a video, you know, I'm noticing that you're listening to me, that you're nodding. I notice that you look down at your computer, but I'm I'm much more connected to who you are right now. And if I and, and if you can uh, notice, 
and then be curious about what you notice. So if I was practicing that right now, because we can see each other in video, I would say, you know, I, I, I could see that we were talking and then you looked down. What was that about? And you might have said, well, I was just checking our time. I was just checking such and such. But if I could stop myself, notice that and ask you about it, you would feel, boy, he's really present as opposed to we're being two talking heads. And so I, I would say to people, be a first class noticer. Also something he told me, uh, I'll give you some of my favorite quotes from him. Be more interested in people than interesting. Now that's a problem for me because I, I, I can get away with being interesting and it's tempting to do that because I, I know I have interesting stories, but I'm at my best when I'm more interested. And my favorite line of his, which I just think is so eloquent, uh, it was, boredom occurs when I fail to make the other person interesting. To me, that, that is a beautiful directive. I like it because it's pushing it back on you as well, and it's allowing you to take responsibility for the situation you're in, which is powerful. Absolutely. Awesome stuff. Mark, <laughs> I like the way you've, you've already teed up your next like five episodes that you're going to be coming on over the next few years. I appreciate that. Tell us a little bit more about the book. You've mentioned it. Tell us, uh, tell us a little bit more about it and where we can find it. And of course, we'll link to it in the show notes or at salesman.red as well. Okay, so just listen and talking to crazy. I have another book called Real Influence, which was sandwiched between them. So if you like my stuff and you got Just Listen and Talking to Crazy, you might want to check out Real Influence. So uh, they're all available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Uh, they're all on Kindle. The difference between Just Listen and Talking to Crazy, Just Listen is listening in to people. Talking to Crazy is you listen in and you lean into them and disarm them and get them to talk uh, – let get them to listen to reason. I'm, I'm part of a program that we hope will be training police and community to de-escalate when, uh, when they confront each other. And it's called the popprotocol.org, pop popprotocol.org. And that stands for pullover protocol. So what we want to do is to train civilians and police, but especially civilians, this is what you do when a police officer pulls you over so that you don't get agitated and you don't agitate him or her. Amazing stuff. That's new on me. So I'll link to that in the show notes. I'll uh, look into that and I, I, that could be a podcast in itself of when you, uh, and it happens and it's happened to me, even with the best intentions, you annoy customers, how to de-escalate that before it becomes, and I've had it before, <laughs> customers ringing my sales manager, complaining and wanting to go up the food chain. Uh, and I hadn't even done anything wrong. I just used the wrong language and I communicated over text message rather than phoning them and things were misconstrued. So that's uh, that's, that's your eighth episode, Mark, that you can go on to talk to us about. So I appreciate that. And we'll link to all that in the show notes over at salesman.red. And with that, Mark, I want to thank you for your time. Again, I really appreciate it. And I want to thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. I'm always happy to join you and look forward to the next one. And there we have it. Mark, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you, Sales Nation, for tuning in. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, whether you are driving around listening to this on iTunes or Stitcher or Overcast. I appreciate it. I appreciate all the reviews that are coming in. That's a massive deal for us. And it really does make a huge difference. If you want to leave a review and you want to make an impact on the show and help it grow, just head over to salesman.red forward slash review. And with all that said, I'll speak with you again tomorrow.